real estate within the school district of Philadelphia under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 150167, amending chapter 19-1500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Wage and Net Profits Tax by revising certain tax rates under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 150438, amending section 19-1806 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Authorization of Realty Use and Occupancy Tax to further authorize the Board of Education of the School District of Philadelphia to impose a tax on, tax on the use or occupancy of real estate within the School District of Philadelphia and to set the rate for such tax and making technical changes all under certain terms and condition and re resolution number 150179, providing for the approval by the Council of the City of Philadelphia of a revised five-year financial plan for the City of Philadelphia covering fiscal years 2016 through 2020 and incorporating proposed changes with respect to fiscal year 2015 with it to be submitted by the Mayor to the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority, the authority pursuant to the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement authorized by an ordinance of this council approved by the Mayor on January 3rd, 1992, Bill number 1563-A, by and between the City and the authority. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Today we continue the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole to consider various bills read by Ms. Lewis that can constitute proposed operating and capital spending measures for fiscal year 2016, a capital program, and a forward-looking capital plan for fiscal year 2016 through fiscal year 2021. Today we will hear testimony from these city departments, revenue, BRT, and, and also hear the, uh, on the revenue tax bills. Um, and then there will be a break. There will be public testimony later this evening. Um, so the first department is Revenue Department. Commissioner. Good afternoon. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Clarina Tolson. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Revenue and the City's Chief Collections Officer. Uh, with me is Mr. Frank Breslin, who's the Deputy Commissioner for our Tax Bureau. And if I could, um, uh, Mr. Chair, just like to acknowledge Mr. Breslin. Uh, today is his uh, last opportunity to sit with us. He will be retiring next week after 31 years of service to the City of Philadelphia. Congratulations, sir. Thank and, you. And, uh, thank you for all your service. Thank you. Thank you. I thought Mr. President was smiling a little bit more than I usually <laughs> see him. He's the happiest man in the room. <laughs> I'll just stay. Please proceed. Good afternoon, members of uh, City Council and the Committee of the Whole. My name is Clarina Tolson, Chief Collections Officer and Revenue Commissioner. The following testimony provides an overview of the Department of Revenue's FY16 operating budget and our strategies and goals. Last year, I spoke to you about the, the exciting progress we were making in the collection of delinquent taxes with improvements in collections for, SI, for school income tax, liquor by the drink, and real estate. I'm glad to share, though pending appeals for AVI have impacted real estate-based taxes, we expect to exceed $100 million in prior year real estate collections for the second year in a row. In addition, we expect to meet target projections in other prior year collections with an anticipated increase of close to 25% for SIT, the school income tax. We continue to experience success with our newest collection initiatives, uh, commercial, activity commercial activity license application, revocation and sequestration, with both programs combined bringing in over $50 million since their inception. In addition, we continue to expand the use of more traditional tools such as sheriff sales, with filings increasing over 17% uh, since uh, 2014 and 900% since uh, 2009. Our newest tool should come online in June with an online sale of tax liens. This pilot program will help us identify how to best approach the sale of real estate tax liens in the future. In addition to the lien sale, the department is also excited about the following initiatives. Our cashiering and remittance program, with the new state of the art cashiering uh, remittance uh, system that will be fully implemented by June. Our earned income tax credit program that uh, assisted uh, over 5,000 uh, individuals in receiving $9 million in total refunds and $2.4 million in EITC uh, funding and also save them $500,000 in tax preparation fees. 
uh, our modernized electronic filing um, that was uh, installed in April of this year, which enabled taxpayers to file and pay their business income and receipts tax and net profits tax electronically, and also uh, allowed us to partner with tax software providers who modified their products to further expand electronic tax filings. Uh, through this, over 17,000 taxpayers filed electronically. Uh, implementation of our data warehouse, we are moving aggressively uh, with that program and expect to see some increases in delinquent collections um, to be realized from this project early in fiscal uh, 16. There have been significant customer service improvements where we have improved the uh, customer experience uh, through improvements with our taxpayer services phone system, our cash sharing system, and we're going to be expanding our payment options and the like uh, later this year. We also worked with the University of Pennsylvania with an experiment with regard to messaging uh, that we had the opportunity to generate approximately $250,000 worth of, of revenue for the city. As well, we've worked with a, a, a grant that we have received through the City Accelerator Program, and through this, we're innovating to increase enrollment in our uh, assistance programs, have people better understand uh, how they may access and be involved in uh, assistance programs. Uh, the department continues to meet our organizational goals, uh, such as MBEC participation, promoting diversity in the workplace. Uh, with an executive staff of over 50% minority and close to the same for women, we are proud of our work inclusion. Our WBE, the MBE, uh, DBE participation is also expected to approach 50% this year. The budget proposed here allows the department to meet its mission of revenues for schools and services. Therefore, we request your favorable consideration of this budget. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And just a couple questions and, and go to other members. Um, the Earned Income Tax Credit Program. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? How many, if you have any statistics or if you can get us, how many Philadelphians are benefiting and do, is there other uh, strategy to kind of reach other eligible Philadelphians on, for that program? Yes, we were just able to start our involvement with that uh, program this year. Uh, we were in collaboration with the um, Campaign for Working Families, mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite a successful initial effort. Uh, through that program, we were able to uh, have 5,000 people participate at the sites that the City Department of Revenue sponsored. Uh, those individuals uh, received um, $9 million worth of refunds. Of that $9 million, $2.4 million was in EITC tax, uh, tax refunds. So it was federal dollars, not city dollars. Uh, additionally, they were able to save approximately $500,000 in tax filing uh, costs because uh, through our sites, we offered free tax filings. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, um you were working with the Campaign for Working Families, and, and, and I think that was certainly beneficial. Is there any other strategy that's thought about to try to, re, to, try to get as many Philadelphians as, uh, that are eligible to, to apply? Certainly. Uh, we will have an aggressive uh, outreach campaign, um, whether it be through uh, our blog captains, door-to-door, -door, other marketing, uh, through mailings, uh, electronically, telephonically. Uh, as a department, we're using more email as a way to um, contact and reach our taxpayers. So we'll be making an aggressive uh, effort to get assistance for people, certainly to the extent that we get other folks money to help um, support them. That's, that's a very good thing for us. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, obviously, uh, there's a, a, going to be a request for a, for a tax increase to, uh, for, the, for, the res, uh, for the property owners of Philadelphia. Um, there's a number of taxes that are self-reporting taxes. Yes. Um, can you talk about uh, how successful that has been in, in getting the folks who have to self-report to, to do it? And are there any other measures? Because I think we're going to hear from one of the criticisms of uh, the property tax increases often that there's not there's other taxes out there that you're not collecting. You know, not not you, the, sure. the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. 
So I, could you talk about that a little bit, about the self-reporting taxes? And sure, I'll start on that, and then I'll let Mr. Breslin sure. uh, uh, add some information to that. Mm -hmm. So self-reported taxes certainly can appear to be a, a challenge, and historically, they may have been one that uh, posed a greater challenge to us than they will in the future. Our, our future, and, and actually now our present, is one where we uh, share data with both the state and the federal government, and we're getting more and more information um, about our taxpayers to assist us with the underreporting or uh, complete lack of reporting, people who don't file uh, properly. Um, as well, we are increasing our compliance efforts and audit efforts to try to gain uh, more information and pursue uh, people to um, help them uh, properly pay their the, the appropriate tax levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll let Mr. Breslin uh, add to that if there's anything that I may have missed there. You know, I'll just add that, um, you know, we talk about, with these self-assessed taxes, we're dealing with um, voluntary compliance. And voluntary compliance is the most um, efficient way to collect taxes. So the first step is really for us to make the taxes easy to file, educate taxpayers, educate the professionals. So that, that's really the first level that we start with in the department. We do a lot of outreach. Um, we constantly review our forms, take suggestions, and try to make the taxes as easy to follow and as easy to file. And then when we get past that, the voluntary compliance piece, we have to get into the involuntary compliance is where we really go out and try to identify taxpayers. And I'll break that down into two areas. One is tax discovery, where we look for taxpayers who are really flying under the radar. They're just not registered. They're not filing. We don't really know who they are until we can go out and find them. And we use, you know, kind of boots on the street. We have investigators that go out. We have a tax fraud hotline where we um, uh, solicit information from taxpayers out there from citizens, um, and we use a lot of third party, I and mean, a lot of it is now driven by technology. We use a lot of third party information. Um, we, have, we receive information from the IRS, we receive information from the state of Pennsylvania, um, other third party information, and we try to identify those taxpayers. And that's been very successful, and we think it's going to be even um, greater success once we bring this uh, data warehouse on board. Um, the other piece that's really important to us uh, is the audit piece, and especially with uh, the business income and receipts tax, where we have taxpayers who may be filing erroneously, um, not filing correctly, not reporting all of their income, and there's all categories of um, noncompliance. And we use, um, we have uh, screening techniques where we try to identify tax returns that are filed incorrectly or improperly, and we bring those into our uh, audit process. We will also be using the data warehouse to help us better identify um, cases to audit. <clears throat> Is there a target amount of money that you think you can uh, raise at the increase? You know, you talk about some of the measures you're taking. Is there a, like an estimate of how much more you could bring in with, or will be able to bring in with those kind of uh, activities? I don't have a, a, a hard number. I mean, we've talked to a lot of other jurisdictions who have brought on data warehouses, and they really talk about their lifting collections, and it, it's not uncommon to see, you know, 15, 20 percent increases in collections. But we're, you know, so now that's kind of the impetus. We've talked to a lot of other jurisdictions and saw uh, great success there. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Councilman Jones, you ready? I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Chairman. Um, real quick, and you probably answered this question, and I was not paying attention, <laughs> but I will be brief in repeating. Um, the liens outside of Philadelphia County, the process by which we have owners of Philadelphia properties. So you didn't answer. Oh, good. So um, that you have Philadelphia properties that have outside of Philadelphia ownership and putting liens on those properties outside of Philadelphia's jurisdiction. How are we doing in establishing those reciprocities with other counties? Um, I'm going to ask um, our chief uh, legal expert in the Department of Revenue who heads up our, our law bureau, to, uh, Mr. Frank Piva, to address that, sir. Um. Council, um, my name is Frank Piva. I'm Chief Revenue Counsel for the City of Philadelphia. Um, yes, back in November of 
2013, uh, the General Assembly uh, gave municipalities throughout the Commonwealth of uh, the authority to um, take our liens and transfer them to other jurisdictions where the owner of the lien has other property and to treat that lien as a judgment against that property. Uh, we were excited to start to use this. Um, in order to do that, we had to work with the um, First Judicial District um, to implement rules to that end. Uh, we met with them last August, and uh, after some negotiations, it was made clear to us that there was some IT issues that had to be corrected. And so we've worked with the First Judicial District. As of last Saturday, that fix has been put through, and now we have the green light to actually find the properties and to start to do the transfers. Um, I, I, it's hard to believe how long some of these IT things oh, no, it is. take to, to happen. No, no, it's not. We believe you. We believe you about IT. Yeah, but I, I should say it's not it's not an all an IT issue. There certainly have been some administrative issues that had to be addressed as well. So so the universe of property owners that are fully delinquent, what is that value of that property amount? Um, I do not have that number off the we top did, of my head. We, there was an article that was done uh, a couple of years back, I believe it was, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it chronicled how much that was. And if I, if I recall, and please don't hold me to it, it was in a neighborhood of $300 million that where people actually own delinquent properties here, but in their respective municipalities were paying their local taxes. So if we can start to stir up the pot, if you would, by putting liens on those uh, mainline homes, so that the North Philly homes actually get the proper uh, tax uh, payments that we need, we can start to do it. So do we have a sense of what that universe is? Uh, one second, sir. We're looking for the number. We do have that. All right. So looking if I couldn't find a Councilman, 7% um, of our uh, delinquency, uh, the, our delinquent accounts, 7% of our delinquent accounts are in Pennsylvania, but not in Philadelphia. So what does that represent by real dollars? Uh, it's prox uh, in terms of dollars, I don't have that number, but we can get it for you. Well, we'll we got some public school grads here. Let, can we get somebody to work on but that? But that's on the number of accounts, so yeah. we have to figure it out for the, for the, yeah. the dollar value. So. Um, that would be interesting as we start to contemplate how we uh, get a $105 million ask. There's a lot of money still sitting on the shelf, and you've done a wonderful job to, to improve that. But I think the, the whale that we want to get, and, 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 and for a matter of respect, that if you live in Montgomery or Potter County, for all I care, and you own properties here, but you're willing to pay your home county tax, but not willing to pay us, they, they, we need to really address that. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, I know it was before you started, but the city offered that tax amnesty program in 2010. Um, do you know how many people enrolled in it and how much was collected in real estate taxes from that program? Uh, we do know that, Councilwoman. I didn't, excuse me one second. Anybody have a book? Okay. How about for, um, Councilman, if I can get you that number shortly versus holding, holding you up, if, unless it's uh, critical that you have to answer right now. Okay. And, uh, we ask that to see, uh, to question the viability of offering another amnesty program uh, so that people may, especially in areas where people are calling and crying about gentrification. Yes. Well, 
Uh, I think I can answer your question with, without, if I don't have that number with me, if you don't mind. Uh, we've, we've analyzed uh, the performance during the amnesty period and compare that to our uh, collection performance since then. And certainly in the last uh, two years, uh, under Mr. President's leadership with regard to commercial activity, uh, license revocation, with Mr. Brett, with Mr. Piva also with sequestration, uh, we have far outstripped uh, the uh, performance of, of, um, of collections for delinquent property taxes without amnesty. Uh, and we also found that uh, a number of amnesty counts, uh, a significant number took advantage of amnesty at the time, but then, then did not subsequently stay compliant. Uh, so there was a one-time infusion as, as opposed to it being ongoing, it was not. What we're doing now with regard to our compliance efforts and collecting on delinquent taxes will be reoccurring and will not be a one-time bump in our activity. And we actually have some uh, graphs that can show that, and I can send those to your office and share those with council members. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Commissioner. Thank, thank you very you, much. And uh, if I'm not too much of a piglet here, I'd like to just say again, thank you to uh, Mr. Breslin for all that he Absolutely. has done. He has been um, uh, a, a wonderful uh, participant and leader in the process of tax management for the city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Breslin. Enjoy your retirement, sir. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, our next department is the Board of Revision of Taxes. Huh? Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of Council. I'm Carla Pagan, Executive Director of the Board of Revision of Taxes. Um, before you today to testify on the fiscal year 2016 operating budget. And I'd ask before we take the floor to questions, um, if I can just share with you the biggest accomplishment our department has had over this past uh, fiscal year. Um, after receiving over 23,000 2014 appeals from AVI, the board has exhausted or scheduled or rendered decisions on 97% of those. So we're so pleased to um, share that with council. And um, we're also well underway and starting to hear 2015 residential appeals. Um, so that's good news we wanted to share first. That's it? Yep. Oh, okay. All right. You just wanted to brag about the good stuff first. Sweet and simple, you. yes. Right. Okay. Well, actually, I was going to ask about appeal. So, uh, just so I'm clear, 97% of 2014, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, how, do you have in raw numbers how, much, how many appeals there actually were? How many appeals are actually what? Were filed. Yes. Yeah, so, for 2014, um, 24,270 appeals were filed. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, as of July 14th of this year, we will have 839 left open, unscheduled, and no decisions rendered. Okay. And 2015, how many? Uh, how so, many? for tax year 2015, we received 4,780 appeals. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have, we've gone through 43%, or 43% are still left open. So, we've started mm -hmm. to actually hear residential cases for tax year 2015. Okay. Now, I don't know, maybe Mr. DeBeau can answer this better, but I know when we talked about all the appeals that were going to be filed for 2014, we yes. knew there was going to be a certain, I think it was allowed a certain amount of money was uh, estimated would be lost. Uh, do you have details on how that, that came out? Was there more or less? Somewhere around the same? I can tell you approximately of the, of the appeals that the board reduced, it yeah. comes to about 335 million. That's an approximate number. 335 million decrease. Decreases. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. DeBoe, From board revisions. This? Okay. That does not include other settlements and things like that. No, I got you. I was just mm -hmm. thinking about the appeals. So that, um, just to be clear, that's in 
assessed value. Mm -hmm. So the tax value, you have to play the, the tax rate to that to get the dollar value of the tax reduction. Okay. Um, I think in general the reductions have kind of been in line with where we thought they were. I think one of the complications has been, as you know, that um, taxpayers can pay their old amounts until right. the appeals are resolved. And I think that's led to, uh, uh, hopefully temporarily, are seeing lower property tax collections than we anticipated because people are paying the old amounts. Mm -hmm. and, w and while you're here, maybe I should ask the commissioner this. I know there's still this delay in getting the, the bills correct. Do you know where that stands, Mr. DeBow? Um, I am not sure about the certification issue and the how long the certification issue A lot of and kind of getting the getting the new certs to you guys. Mm -hmm. I know you've been meeting with OPA. Yes. And we, we've been working with um, Office of Property Assessment mm -hmm. and certainly uh, the PRT. And, yeah. uh, they have uh, taken. Um, uh, a, a little bit of time over the last month and a half to strategically address uh, what we, for lack of a better word, are called a backlog or some of the, the things that had been in the pipeline for certification, uh, and they're getting to this very quickly. By the end of June, they, uh, they believe that mid, mid to late June, they believe that they will only be about three weeks behind the whole certification process from mm -hmm. the time that you have your hearing in BRT the time that they can process and then we get it and can process it about three weeks. So does that so, mean? So, so in, another, in another three to four weeks, the process for all, all intent and purposes will be very good. And that, that'll mean that basically people will have the correct bills, is that? That's correct. That's correct. That's a right. short way of saying it, because that's what I think we still hear that, you know, I want my appeal, but they're sending me bills that don't, you know, that aren't consistent with that, that kind of thing. So you're saying by the end of June, that should be resolved? Yes. Yes, it Okay. Will. All right. Thank We're going to hold you to that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, got off on a couple other things, but uh, one other question for you. If uh, the, the CAMA system, I think you say that will dramatically reduce the amount of processing and all that. Could you just describe that a little bit, like how much, why that will make such a significant difference in your opinion? Yes. Yeah, so even though the CAMA system is mainly used for mass appraisal, a piece of that does include um, appeal filing for, pe for those that want to, you know, appeal their market value. So right now, the system that we use to enter in appeals, manage them, do all the data entry, and even send out hearing letters, decision letters, it's antiquated. Um, it's similar to those systems just after the typewriter before Windows. So with CAMA, it will streamline the process that we bring in new appeals. Um, a lot of electronic filing can happen with that and scanning and using barcodes. And also automate a lot of decisions and things that we do manually now, okay. printing letters and so forth. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you. Um, in line with what you've been asking and Commissioner, what you've been saying, our people are still saying in my area that they're getting their 2016 assessments as recently as the 18th, 18th of May, right, day before election, mm. and that the deadline for appealing is May 26th. So what can we do? I mean, will an extension time be given? And uh, if so, when? Uh, and uh, we'd like to get information out to our constituents regarding that, if you're willing to do that. So yes, that's actually an OPA concern. So the OPA sent out those assessment notices. The appeal that you're referring to that's in that, for, in that mailing is actually a first level review or um, an initial review or appeal th with the OPA. And I'm almost sure they are gonna follow and honor that deadline. But the formal appeal with the Board of Revision of Taxes, they have until the first Monday of October to get in. So if, in fact, they miss that first appeal filing deadline, they still have a chance to appeal at the BRT. The, the only downside um, to a BRT appeal versus the first level review is that if they file a first level review and the assessment office warrants, says it, the account warrants a reduction, that reduction is usually put in the system 
before their tax bill goes out. Um, so that's one downside. But I think on that bottom of their first level review appeal form, it does say you might have 30 days from the date the notice was received. So I'd really encourage them to get those first level review forms in, yeah. Even if they feel like they're a week or two weeks late. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because eight days sounds awful tight. And I know you say it's that's tight. not your, but that, that's, <laughs> that's kind of tight. You know? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you for all you're doing there. Thank you, okay. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you, Council. Mr. DeBeau, you're back. Revenue bills. I know you're looking forward to discussing this. I look forward to every hearing. Come on. Now, you said that with a straight face, too. Come on. both scaring us with those big folders. Yeah. They're important. So should we, should we start? Yeah, please. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rob Dubo. I'm the Director of Finance, and I'm here to testify on Bills 150165, 150166, and 150167. I'm joined at or close to the table by uh, Rebecca Reinhardt, Budget Director, and Clunia Tolson, the Revenue Commissioner. Bill 150165 would authorize an increase in the real estate tax rate to support enhanced educational investments for Philadelphia school children. Under the bill, public school portion of the property tax rate, which supports both district and charter managed schools, would increase from 0.7382% to 0.8633% in FY16. This action would generate about $105 million in stable recurring revenue to help fill an existing approximately $85 million deficit um, and to fund investments that were described in Dr. Height's Action Plan 3.0. Our schools and students have gone through several painful years of funding crises caused by a number of factors, but primarily cuts in state funding and the end of federal stimulus funds. The district has struggled to balance its budget and avoid running out of cash. It's made unavoidable cuts that have seen the services it provides deteriorate to a level that no one thinks is acceptable. At the same time as the schools were making painful and unavoidable cuts to ensure that those cuts weren't substantially worse, the mayor and city council were taking steps to add funding to the district through a combination of tax increases, parking fee increases, improved property tax collections, and increasing the city's grant to the district, among other steps. The city's Elected officials increased funding to our schools by more than it had been increased at any point in at least 30 years. In total, $360 million in recurring revenues have been added since FY09. While these increased dollars were necessary, the funding alone has not been sufficient to allow the schools to provide for the safe school environments and necessary curricular and extracurricular activities for Philadelphia youth. We know that the only way the schools will receive the funding that is needed to give the city's children the education they deserve is if the state does its share. That means that the state must increase funding and adopt a full and fair funding formula. While I'll discuss Governor Wolf's proposal in more detail later in the testimony, even with an increase to an appropriate level of state funding, there's more that must be done at the local level. That's why Superintendent Height has asked both the city and state to make additional investments for our school children next year. Uh, recognizing that the state must bear the larger portion of that investment, Dr. Height asked the Commonwealth to provide substantially more than he has asked the city to provide. The requested city portion of the investment is $105 million. Uh, 
Dr. Haidt has laid out a clear vision for how those investments would be made in district-operated schools. If both revenue increases, the state and local increases, are approved, the schools would be able for the first time in years to focus on making investments to provide essential educational opportunities for Philadelphia school children rather than considering crippling cuts just to ensure that schools can remain open. These investments include providing social, emotional, and behavioral health interventions uh, and support to many more students who experience adverse uh, childhood experiences, counseling, health, and library services to students who experience decline in those services, more students with opportunities to participate in advanced programming, such as advanced placement, international baccalaureate, and dual enrollment, and resources to support district turnaround schools and expand or replicate high-performing schools. Without the additional funding, our schools will have another bleak year, increasing costs for pensions, health care, debt service, and charters, all of which are beyond the district's ability to control, combined with stagnant revenue, would once again force the district into a position in which it has to cut, make cuts rather than investments. Given those choices, the mayor believes it's essential for both the Commonwealth and the city to provide stable recurring revenues to invest in the education of the city's children. Governor Wolf's proposed budget would provide $159 million in basic education funding for the district. The district would also receive an additional $25 million in cyber charter reimbursements. This proposal would provide critical investments to help address past years of declining state funding. The mayor's has proposed providing $105 million through a property tax increase. While the mayor doesn't like the idea of raising taxes, he believes it's a better option than facing another year of cuts. In considering how to generate additional revenue, the administration looked for a local source that would provide stable recurring revenue beginning in FY16 without needing any state action so that the district could plan for the future knowing that its revenues were secure. We believe that the best option is an increase in the property tax. While we understand increasing the property tax will create an increased burden for taxpayers, we'd like to provide some context about the proposed increase. The median residential property in Philadelphia is valued at $113,100. Under this proposal, property tax increases on the median home value would increase by about $104 in FY16. Um, more than 42 percent of Philadelphia's residential, pro residential properties are valued at below 100000 Their additional tax would be under $88 a year, less than $750 a month. Those proposed increases could be offset by portions of the governor's proposal. In addition to proposing to increase funding for our schools, the governor's proposed substantial tax relief. That relief includes wage tax, sales tax, cigarette tax, and the property tax. Philadelphia would receive about $88 million in property tax relief in FY17 to be used to increase the amount of the homestead exemption to the maximum amount allowed under state law. Moreover, the proposal provides a, about $2 million to go towards reducing property tax rates, which would decrease the rate from 1.4651 if the mayor's proposal were enacted to 1.4633 in FY17. The resulting changes to the property tax rate increase for the school district, combined with the larger homestead exemption, would mean that a typical Philadelphia homeowner would see a decrease in their current property tax bill by $287 um, from 15 to 17, although the bills would increase from 15 to 16 by $104. Combined, the governor's, the mayor's and the governor's proposals would provide our schools um, with $289 million in new resources and investments to provide essential educational opportunities for Philadelphia school children. Even if both the mayor's and the governor's proposals are enacted by FY17, C residents would see a combination of lower taxes and increased investments in education. The administration believes that it's critical to provide stable, recurring funding to our schools in order to invest in educating our children. Bill 150165 provides such revenue without having a negative impact on the city's general fund or requiring any further action in Harrisburg. And to switch over to Bill 150166, um, that authorizes the same tax rate for the use and occupancy rate as is currently in place. Um, Bill 150167 would authorize a decrease 
in the wage earnings and net profits tax rate for both residents and non-residents. The rate's now 3.92% for residents, 3.4915% for non-residents. The resident rate includes a portion for PICA uh, to pay debt service on PICA bonds. Um, the bill would lower the rates to 3.9102 for residents and 3.4828 for non-residents. Um, that concludes my testimony, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Bo. Sure. Um, it said, uh, you say in your testimony, in considering how to generate additional revenue, the administration looked for a local source that provides stable. Right. Um, you decided on the, uh, the real estate tax increase. Could you talk about other things you looked at and why you didn't think they were the right way to go? Um, sure. I mean, when we talked about options, there wasn't anything else that could provide that level of revenue without, you know, really dramatic increases. Like the UNO, for example, to get um, 105 million out of the UNO, you'd need an 80 percent increase. So, you know, how much? 80 percent increase. 80 percent? Yeah, I'd get that. You know, so we didn't think that was a reasonable option. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Well, was there any other place, maybe a combination of things that so, I mean, you in terms possibly of, looked at? In terms of revenues that go to the district, mm -hmm. property tax is the only one that's large enough not to require an enormous increase to generate mm -hmm. that kind of revenue. Mm -hmm. how, um, how many in real estate taxes, real estate tax increases have there been over the last, well, say through the, this administration? Um, there was one for the city, mm -hmm. um, one straight for the school district, and I think one that was a city side but went to the district. So I think and that was in the same year. In the same year, right? So it's two, two, years. two, two years, three different increases. Two years, three two. different increases. Okay. All right. Um, now you talk about the governor's plan, which I personally think is is a good one, but obviously Me very too. ambitious up there, right. <laughs> uh, and obviously that's the. I guess you would say the best argument for a property tax increase if that uh, the governor's plan passes. But I mean, realistically, you know, any idea, and I know the problem we have is we got to do what we have to do before right. Harrisburg does what it has to do, if it ever, whenever it does it. <laughs> so has, what conversations has there been up there? Where? So we've had a lot of conversations. Um, last week, it was last week, the House moved a, a bill uh, from Representative Saylor, Republican, uh, that was also a tax relief bill. And while it provides a lot less tax relief for Philadelphia, I think about 200 rather than the over 400 from the governor's bill, it was focused only on property tax and actually provided more property tax relief for the city than the governor's proposal. And I think the conversation up there has been that there'll be some type of compromise on relief. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like, you know, the two proposals, one from the governor and one from the Republicans, vary on property tax relief, but the Republican one is actually more relief than what we're talking about in this testimony. More? more for the property tax, mm -hmm. nothing for anything else, but more for property tax. So the, right now the Republican plan focuses solely on, on property tax. Relief. Correct. It's a combination of, I think it's about $120 million for a rate decrease and about $75 million for homestead relief, mm -hmm. whereas the governor's proposal has about $88 million for property tax relief than with money for wage tax relief, sales tax relief, cigarette tax relief. So when you put that all together, when you look at the total budget, how, so we lose out, is that what you're saying? If, yeah, if, under if the governor's plan, proposal, we get, I think it's $458 million in tax relief, mm -hmm. and under the sailor proposal, it's $200 million. Mm, okay. But I, I'm sure there's still a lot of negotiating going on. Uh, we'll I, be going, yes. we'll be going up there. Right. Okay, if I just have one other question. I see Councilman O once asked too, uh, on, an, on another area, the commercial tax liens. Uh, how much revenue is expected to be re uh, realized from that? Do you have that or? So we're doing a, a pilot um, this year to look at kind of the best way to do that. Uh, I think we think that kind of the upper limit on the commercial real estate liens would be somewhere in the $60 million range combined 
um, city and school district. Mm -hmm. So the school district portion may be like in the 35 range and the city portion the 25. Okay. I think that's, I think those are the numbers. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Councilman O. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Where? Sorry, I just want it's 30, it's about 55 million. So 30 on the um, school district side, 25 on the city side. On the okay. Yeah. Thank you. Council. So in the, uh, in the wage reduction, um, why are you reducing the, uh, the rate for non-residents? Why, why is that being reduced? So when we look at the wage tax reduction, um, it's really intended to, as kind of to help stimulate the economy and help employers choose to employ people in Philadelphia. Sure, I'll get right to the when point. We, can I I'll just let me answer? Sure. And, then, um, and one of the things that we look at to say, okay, this works is analysis done um, by Bob Inman up at Penn. And he actually finds that the non-resident wage tax is more effective in terms of creating jobs than the resident side. So in terms of job creation, based on his analysis, it's actually more effective. So for us, it's important to you know, reduce both sides. Okay, I, I have great respect for him. All I'm saying is that if you focused, I'm just for argument's sake, if you focused on residential workers and decrease more significantly the wage tax cut for them, uh, it is more likely, in my opinion, that jobs would be focused on people who live in Philadelphia and pay additional taxes in the city, as opposed to people who come to the suburban areas and come to work in the city. So we would get more tax revenues rather than uh, providing a slighter decrease in, in, in wage tax and not capitalizing on the real estate and other taxes that we would collect, including sales tax inside the city. Um, and, and I'm just bringing that up because I, I don't really um, completely agree with this idea about the wage tax proposed by Governor Wolf, um, because I did propose a wage tax which is particular to Philadelphia, so, so I'm biased. But the other point of it is that I'm really not in favor of increasing uh, the property tax. And, and I would like to, to see uh, what were the other alternatives. What happened to the advertising, the commercial buildings and all that? I know we've been talking about that. What happened to alternative sources of revenues? So as I you know, said to Councilman Greenlee, there's no other real source that would generate this much. I mean, in terms of kind of so the advertising, you know, we put out a bid that doesn't generate a lot of money. This is $105 million. You need to do something significant to get so, there. So could I propose at least that if we did the taxi medallions, that's $150 million, and at least you would have three years of $50 million. The, the delinquent wage, I mean, the delinquent tax collection improvement would be approximately $26 million a year on a de decreasing basis. but. I mean, it's the, the end of the administration to be putting in like a whole stabilization of the school district. How about the new mayor come in and do that because you're at the end of eight years now? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the school children of Philadelphia actually need the money in the year coming up. They can't keep having to wait. So we don't think waiting makes sense. Medallion sales, they haven't even been successful in their last couple of medallion sales. So say, I'm say not, again? they haven't even been successful in their tax, the last couple of tax medallion sales, so I don't know why you think it would generate that much revenue. Because the problem with the tax medallion sales is that when you only offer like 30 or 40 medallions, a bank is not going to finance it, therefore there's nobody's interested in purchasing it. But when you sell 300 medallions, a bank will finance that and people will purchase it, roughly. But in other words, um, it's in the quantity of the sale, not, not in the per uh, medallion sale. You're not going to generate any sales that way. Well, you also, medallion sales not recurring revenue. We need recurring revenue too. And so, I understand, but you know, at $150 million, that's at least something you could do over three years to get $50 million for yeah, three years. And 
I would really like to see that analysis, how you get to that $150 million. Okay, I'll, I'll okay. be happy to share it with yeah. you because Thanks. that may be an alternative in the immediate future against a 9.32% tax increase on real estate. Well, again, that increases a recurring stable source that the district can count on for years and years going forward. I, I and that's what a, we think I think they it need. hurts a lot of people. I think it hurts a lot of people. So I understand the desire to help. And I want to help the schools, but not at the price of hurting people in the neighborhoods and communities. I think, you know, the issue is that, is that the best that you got after eight years? It is. It is the only proposal that has been put up this, in the last several months that gets recurring stable revenue at that level to the school district that um, doesn't require state action and that will be in place for FY16. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, question, can you just go review your, your explanation to, that you just gave the Councilman O in terms of the decrease in wage tax to non-city residents? Oh, the, the reductions for non-residents? Yeah. Yeah. So the kind of rationale for the cuts is to help stimulate our economy. Um, there's a professor up at Wharton named Bob Inman who analyzes. Okay. There's a professor up at Wharton named Bob Inman who kind of analyzes the impacts of tax changes. And his analysis showed that in terms of resident and non-resident wage tax, the non-resident wage tax actually has a bigger impact on jobs than the resident impact. Is he a city resident? I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, that's the rationale. Is that, is that analysis provided? Um, we can get it for you, yeah. I mean, he yeah, I'd it. like to um, actually see how, you know, what, what the analysis sure. says. Um, because, you know, obviously city residents feel very differently about it. Understood. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, hi. Hi. I heard you guys were almost done. I said, I got to get in there. <laughs> See, string this out a little longer. Um, no, seriously. Um, I just wanted the conversation that you were having with Councilman O. Yeah. And you referenced that there was only one proposal that created annualized revenue of this level. Is that because you all did not propose, say, an increase in UNO or? an increase in parking taxes, is it because right. you just put that on the table as the sole source of annualized revenue? What I was saying is any, I mean, we're not the only ones who've made proposals, right? So and none of the proposals we've seen have met those criteria. Okay. That's what I was, that's All what right, I was trying I just to say. Because there are other ways to create annualized revenue, UNO. Right, and what we talked about a little before is for UNO to get to 105 million a year, you would need an 80% increase. Okay, so you're suggesting that the 105 million is the only figure that can be achieved in these budget hearings. We're saying know? that's the amount that uh, the superintendent requested. That's an amount that helps solve the district's uh, budget deficit and provides Wait, additional hold on. funding the budget for budget deficit. Yeah, let me just finish. That that um, solves their F projected FY16 deficit, which is about 85 million dollars, and then begins to provide money for the investments that the superintendent laid out in his action plan. So provide it, all right, so there's three things. That 105 from the city you're talking about, right? Yes. And 
that's an, it does more than just solve the deficit. That's correct. And I think the, and the superintendent and made a conscious decision that he didn't want to just ask for an amount that got that left the district at the steady state, which is really at an unacceptable level. Right. And he wanted to be able to make additional investments. And the, and the combination of the request to the state and the city would clearly allow for investments beyond just solving the deficit. And that would be the 300. Roughly, yes. It's, yeah, it's about it's 264 um, plus 25 million dollars in um, cyber charter relief, so it gets close to 300. But that's but that's from the state, right? The cyber charter relief. Cyber charter and the 100 and. $59 million request from the state plus $25 million in cyber relief. So that combination is $184 million plus 105 from the city. Right. So you get close to the 300 All right. So is it your belief that the state is going to contribute the 184? So I believe that they'll, you know, have a back and forth up there and come up with a number, what that number will be. You know, I, I don't know. but. Hope they get as close to that number as you know as possible. So, if the back and forth only generates 100 from the state, are we going to be asked to backfill the additional 80 to get to where Dr. The, Hyde wants us to be? The, the, we've never heard the school district say that. I've, I've never heard that request. So, I don't think so. And they will, so they won't come back next year and say we need an additional 80 because the state only gave 100, the city gave 100, we need 80 more. You know, I mean, I think what it would mean is that there would be a lower level of investments, you know, in the, in the district. Okay. So at what point, and I know you don't know this, the answer to this question, but I have to ask it. Do you think we will have some sense of what's likely to happen on the state, particularly as it relates to the homestead relief? Because that's a, bit, a significant issue right. with us, because we're being asked to raise real estate taxes again with no guarantee that we're going to get um, homestead relief right. that would minimize significantly the level of pain for our residents. Correct. I think the thing that was encouraging in that regard is the bill that moved through the House last week right. that would give property tax relief. And while it gives a lot less total tax relief to Philadelphia, it's focused exclusively on property tax relief. Right. So I think you're now at a place where both Republicans and Democrats in Harrisburg have said you need to do tax relief and that the negotiation will be about what the level of that relief is. Right. So I think that's encouraging. Obviously, there are never any guarantees with legislative bodies. So the, the level the level generated as a result of the Republican was it version, was that Sailor's Bill? Sailor's Bill, yes. How much would that be? For Philadelphia, it would be $200 million, combination of 120 for rate relief and $75 million for um, homestead relief. So how much would the homestead relief allow us to take the homestead up to? Um, I think it's, another, it's probably from about 30. We're at 30 we're now, 30 and it's to about 50 probably, somewhere in that range. All right. So have you done an analysis, and it's probably too soon, on what that Of what that bill means? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if, um, you were, if we were able to get the 50 up to 50, is that what you're saying, up to 50? Yeah. 50,000 so per household? What that would mean for... So the median um, tax bill now is $1,114. Under the mayor's proposal, that goes up by $104. Um, if the sailor bill was enacted, it's both the rate decrease and the homestead that's in there, that would go down to $764, so a $350 decrease from where it is now. Um, the governor's proposal would be at a $280 increase, decrease, sorry, the median. Say that again. 
The governor's proposal, it has less property tax relief, but right. it has wage tax. That would be about a $280 decrease from 15 to 17. The sailor proposal would be about $350 for the median home. Increase. Decrease from Decrease. 15 to 17. So it would go up in 16 and then go down in 17. And the decrease in 17 would be much larger than the increase in 16. Okay. Under either proposal All right. that's up there. Okay. So give you a snapshot. So we've done an analysis on incremental increases and decreases based on revenue generated from real estate taxes. Yes. So various rates. So and then you know how we you know how we do, right? We do. Right. So I just want to make sure I understand. Make sure I understand. So the sailor proposal as is may not get any better than that. Would generate how much exactly? Two hundred well, one hundred and ninety five million. Probably just for homestead relief. Seventy five for homestead. Seventy five. Okay. All right. I gotta throw that in the mix. Okay. Um, and did you do an analysis on uh, UNO, an incremental we, increase? We did a, a series that, that we sent to that for us? staff, yes. Okay, I just want to let people know that we are cooperating. We are. Uh, all right. Okay. And the lean sales, I'm sorry to ask questions if we were already asked. Did you talk about the lean sales today? Um, I don't think that we did not talk about that. Did. Did we talk about lean sales at all? All right, yeah. well, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Thanks. All right, okay, I'm good. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, I think Councilman O had a question. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Uh, could I ask you, the, uh, the PICA portion of the wage tax right now, what is 1.54%? 1 1.5, yes. How much money is that, <laughs> roughly? It's about 350, uh, 50 some million dollars. Per year? Mm-hmm. So that expires in 2023. Correct. Can we negotiate the extension of that tax money today for money tomorrow? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can in you? other words, can we extend, if we were able to extend the PICA portion of the wage tax for five years in exchange for dollars we get today for the schools, and pay it down after the expiration of the wage, the PICO portion of the wage tax. So I just want to kind of take a step back. So the PICA portion of the wage tax. Expires in 2023. Yeah, that was, um, that goes back to 92 when PICA was Understood. created. That was a portion of the wage tax that we already received. There was, we yes. didn't get new tax to get the Understood. PICA portion of the wage tax. So eliminating the PICA portion of the wage tax would be $350 million hit to our budget. Right, so it expires. We don't get that anymore. But wait, can, words, I, can I just add a clarification? Yeah. Um, it is set to expire, but um, the reality of the situation is if we don't at some point re-up that, that there w it would open up a big hole in our budget. So I think your assumption is that we don't need that any mo money anymore when it expires? My bill, which I did on a wage tax, concludes that tax. So when it expires in 2023, it's gone. And I understand that both the administration and the governor are not committed to removing that tax for needs of the city. I'm not proposing that we extend the PICA portion. What I'm saying is uh, I'd like to know that before we get to a property tax increase, that every other possible way of getting the money for the schools that is out there has been considered and explored so that we don't end up, um, you know, adding a tax that's going to hurt folks. Because um, I don't believe the numbers in terms of how many seniors, people on a fixed income, uh, people with uh, disabilities, declining uh, um, conditions of homes, lack of jobs, and other things, that the 9.32% is reasonable. What I'm saying is, have you explored alternative methods if you are anyway going to try to extend that PICA a wage tax that people may be comfortable paying for uh, to get a loan or, or something or money up front on, on the schools so we can 
get a continuing a way to pay for schools that the state is comfortable with, that we are comfortable with, that, that our, that our um, population is comfortable with, because a portion of salaries as opposed to new money that folks got to pull out for paying for their homes, many of which are in disrepair. And I guess what we're trying to say is that's $350 million that comes to the general fund, and if you take that away, you are looking at making massive cuts in the general fund. And that's one of the things that we're trying to avoid in this process. It's due to expire anyway. Right, and we, it's essential that we get it extended. If not, we will face a budget crisis on the city side that is larger than anything we've faced in, in decades, because we would lose $350 million in one year. Okay, so there's a conversation for another day, but I mean, I really would like to, in, okay, anyway, I have great problems with that property tax increase. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, looks like we're done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. For today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, committee will stand in recess until 6.30 p.m., at which time we will have public testimony here in room 400 City Hall. Thank you. neighborhoods. Through festivals, concerts, and art projects, neighborhood cultural nonprofits bring residents together and draw customers to local businesses. They mentor young people, like some of the people with me tonight, and give them the tools to succeed in life. The Philadelphia Cultural Fund is a critical factor to ensure the sustainability of community-based arts and culture. The primary beneficiaries are organizations with small budgets which have a difficult time finding funding from other sources. General operating support from PCF helps them to operate day to day and especially to pay staff salaries. The Norris Square Neighborhood Project in Kensington serves youth and adults with programs in Latino culture. Norris Square helps youth to develop socially responsible businesses and teaches community members how to maintain urban gardens. This makes their neighborhood more economically stable, less prone to violence, healthier and more diverse, and attracts Latinos from all economic backgrounds who are drawn to the neighborhood's strong sense of identity and community. When the council restored the cultural fund budget to 3.14 million last year, the impact was tremendous. 285 organizations received grants, 11 more than the previous year, and all grants were significantly larger. The council's increase also reinstated the youth arts enrichment grants for the first time since 2010. 11 grantees received full project support in addition to their general operating grant. The Scribe Center in West Philly will use their $25,000 grant to fund a 10-month program that teaches teens to create broadcast quality historical documentaries. 95% of their students graduate from high school and 70% go on to college. This year's students will research and investigate the history of policing youth and better ways to maintain order in society. And this year, after Ferguson and Baltimore, what could be more timely? It's imperative that we find ways for our teens to express their frustration in productive ways and to help them believe in the processes of social change. The arts are uniquely qualified to provide this creative outlet. If you want to continue to reap the benefits that these organization, organizations bring to the communities and our youth, you must fund them. I ask the council to ensure level funding for the cultural fund at 3.14 million. Thank you very much. Please proceed. My name is Adrienne Mackey, and I'm here to advocate on behalf of the Philadelphia Cultural Fund. As a member of the arts community with my company, Swim Pony, as a five-time PCF grant recipient, a former panelist, and one of the fund's newest board members. 
There's a lot I want to say about the impact of the fund, but first I'd like to tell you a quick story. In 2004, I moved here as a Midwestern transplant. I missed my hometown of Chicago, and as a chemistry and theater studies double major, I wasn't sure which part of my brain would win out when choosing a professional path. Despite the advice about the supportive scene here, I wasn't exactly sure what it meant to break into the avant-garde theater directing business, but I figured I could always move back home and apply my research experience with copper porphyrin DNA aggregates into some kind of real job. I believed that I had something unique to contribute and that I had a lot of ideas and energy, but I also had a sizable student debt and no trust fund. So I applied to arts foundations in Philly seven times over several years, and seven times I was rejected with feedback like, good proposal, well-articulated ideas, but no evidence of capacity to raise other funds. It was frustrating needing funding to get funding, and I feared that I would succumb to that porphyrin aggregate's siren call of stable income. Luckily, in 2009, I went to an info session for PCF, and later that year, I received my first grant for a whopping $1,700. That money went into projects that raised my artistic profile. Their general operating nature allowed me to build infrastructure that didn't fit into project support, meaning that for the first time, I didn't have to pay for printer paper out of my own pocket. Those funds allowed me to crack the funding ceiling that had held me back for years. It made it possible for me to create a folk musical exploring a labor icon at Eastern State, a 20,000 square foot interactive adventure about the multiverse, and currently a citywide video game live theater hybrid with Drexel's entrepreneurial game studio. The Cultural Fund's general operating program is the only thing like it in the city. And if it's cut, sure, the biggest players stand only to lose a tiny fraction of their income. But to the hundreds of small and mid-sized organizations like me, these funds literally mean the difference between a future of incredible art and chemical aggregate day jobs in Chicago. Thank you. I appreciate the work you do on behalf of Philadelphia and considering the city's investment in the cultural fund. Thank you very much. Good evening, my Good name evening. is Angela Antoinette Bay, and I'm not gonna pretend that I'm an expert about the inner workings of politics and the distribution of money in Philadelphia. However, what I do know is that the budgetary cuts to the Philadelphia Cultural Fund will do nothing but debilitate youth like myself who rely on the arts as not only a means of entertainment, but as an outlet of, in, and an educational system that does nothing but suppress creativity and expression. And how bold of me, a 17-year-old soon-to-be college freshman, to say, and how much do I know about such claims about a complex system that I assumingly know nothing about? To those who doubt my testimony, perhaps what I say today will have you change your minds, and perhaps the reason why you're so willing to cut $1.3 million for PCS budget is because you're detached from the real-life impact that the arts have on Philadelphian youth. I stand before you today as, an in, as a living example of a person whose life was saved by the creative and performing arts. Growing up in Southwest Philadelphia, there aren't many healthy outlets for a girl like me to express myself, let alone in a public school system. I went to John M. Patterson Elementary School where the arts are virtually non-existent. Make, instead of making music and writing stories, my peers were starting fights in the playground, disrupting classes like English and math, and being told subconsciously that their worth is dependent on their understanding of timetables and the scores of their tests. I cannot blame my peers who did not succeed academically to resorting to extracurriculars that are harmful to themselves and others. After all, with nearly $8 million reserved for the construction of a new prison in the Northeast and a cut of over $600 million to education in Pennsylvania as, provo as proposed by Tom Wolf's budget plan, at least my classmates can be assured that there will be a future waiting for them behind bars. Kids will find happiness in the darndest places, and I should know. I found a safe place in writing. My first grade teacher encouraged me to write stories and poetry in order to distract myself from hardships of that year. Due to her and my family's support, my poetry was displayed in such places such as the school cafeteria to Bartram's Gardens to the John Hines Wildlife Center. These moments were some of the happiest of my life, but I couldn't help but feel like I was living, in two, I was living two different lives. Once one in the world of arts who accepted and praised my talents, and another in the world of academics that, although beneficial, was much, less un was much less fulfilling than creatively putting my pen to paper. 
This year, I will be graduating from Friends Select School, and although I am not directly impacted from the cuts to the arts budget of Philadelphia school, Public Schools, as an active member of Philadelphia Young Playwrights, I and students like me will be heavily impacted. In addition, so will my friends from Teen Arden, the Mural Arts Program, Mighty Writers, and other organizations like these. These organizations are not only outlets of creativity, but also hubs of opportunity. For example, through Philly Young Playwrights, I am a youth council member and I have the opportunity to meet in the caucus room right across from this hall um, in an effort to plan and coordinate more arts, program, more arts programming at PYP. I've been invited to countless galas and events on behalf of this program. I was the winner of the Young Voices Monologue Festival where my original piece, Pedestals, which discusses, which discusses racism in private schools, was professionally produced at Interact Theater Company and has toured with PYP throughout um, residencies in school throughout the Philadelphia region. I am a Paula Vogel's Mentors Fellow, where I've been paired with Chiara Legrahudes, a famed alumna of the Philadelphia Young Playwrights and Pulitzer Prize winner for Water by the Spoonful to write a full-length play over the course of this year that is slated to be produced at the Asian Arts Initiative. These opportunities in the arts were only granted to me by PYP alone, and I assure you that I, I, that I have had many more um, throughout my career here. In fact, the arts has had such a huge impact on my life that next year I will be attending Ursinus College on full scholarship due to my work in theater. My saying all of this is not to brag, but to demonstrate how much the arts can cultivate and inspire success. It is not easy. It is easy to undermine the impact of the arts, and it's easy to cut arts funding from schools with students full of potential, talent, and passion outside of the traditional academic subjects. But it is not easy to do so when I sit here before you with undeniable proof that the arts undeniably matter. We are not only being deprived of pens, paints, and musical instruments, and it's much deeper than that. We are also being deprived of the opportunity to act on our potential as the upcoming civically engaged cultural, cultured leaders of this city. I ask you to maintain the cultural fund funding with that in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, hold, on. Hold, on, hold on one second, please. Just had a quick question. Um, can you talk to me about um, the level of job creation and the economic impact that the arts have? I don't know if you have a specific number. I do know many years sitting here, well, there's there are, discussions. Can you just kind of give me a sense of? Yeah, there's about 30,000 people in the city in, in the, the city of Philadelphia that work in the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, the work we've done in Greater Philadelphia identifies 65,000 people that are part of making arts and culture happen. That's mm -hmm. equivalent to 44,000 full-time equivalent jobs, okay. um, and that's for the five-county area. Okay. So it's pretty good return on investment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank, thank you. you. Judith Robinson, Elias Muhammad, and um, Asia Adams. Judith Robinson, Elias Muhammad, and Asia Adams. Um, I'd just like to say that we have a witness list for individuals that have called in earlier. And if there were, if there's anyone here that has not called in and is interested in testifying, we need you to sign up the table to my left. I'm not sure if you guys were here, all here to give support for the individuals. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, maybe I need to do like this. Okay. I would like to ask maybe that. Just, st just state your name for the record. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Elise Muhammad. Um, I would like to ask that $500,000 of the fiscal year 2016 budget goes towards funding of neighborhood advisory committees. Again, my name is Elias Muhammad. I'm the neighborhood advisory committee coordinator with Universal Community Homes. Universal Community Homes was established as a 501c3 nonprofit corporation in 1993 with a focus on community development and education management and since has evolved to have amazing strides in the area of housing, economic, uh, education, uh, community services, uh, family and support services, health and technology. Due to Universal Community Homes having a holistic approach to community revitalization, it has become 
It has become the leading community development and education management organization in the city of Philadelphia. As NAC coordinator, I serve as a connector that helps bring community resources to the forefront of our community. I identify the needs and concerns of community members. Uh, we improve quality of life issues that directly impact our residents. The NAC's goal directly correlates with Universal Community Home's mission of resolving conditions that are affecting the community's quality of life. These conditions vary from unemployment to community failing uh, in the education system to lack of financial intelligence. Losing your home to foreclosure is a terrifying ordeal. Homeowners often do not know where to go for help, are confused by information from the lender, and can just be paralyzed by the fear of losing not one of their only assets, but finding another place to go. Many of these homeowners can be helped and can find ways to stay in their home. Uh, that's what the Philadelphia Residential Mortgage Foreclosure Diversion Program is designed to do. Every month, the NAC, the NACs get a list of homeowners in their service area that are facing foreclosure. Uh, Universal Community Homes NAC, at high moments in the outreach, rec Go ahead. Uh, received uh, up to 50 plus names and addresses of residents per month. Uh, that homes are at risk of foreclosure. To help these families uh, that are facing the loss of foreclosure um, of their homes, the NAC goes door to door and explains the diversion program. Um, once the NAC receives, uh, reaches the, the resident, there are four steps that we instruct the resident to follow. We ask them to actually call the Save Your Homes hotline at 215-334-4663, assemble their financial documents, meet with assigned housing counselors and attend a scheduled conciliation conference. I recall having a community member come to our office whose grandmother was facing foreclosure. Her grandmother was a senior that had a difficult time managing her financial responsibilities. When the community member entered our office with their documents and paperwork, I referred her, to, her and her grandmother to the Dixon House, which is a subdivision of Diversified Community Services, to seek financial and housing counseling. The following month, I found the, her grandmother's name on our list of foreclosure. Once I reached the home, the community member explained to me that she was currently working through their housing difficulties with the Dixon House uh, and to resolve their foreclosure issues. This is just an example of how the NAC can play a critical role in getting, fri getting frightened uh, homeowners to resources that they need to keep their home. More resources for the NAC would meet increased funding towards transportation of NAC representatives during their outreach as far as uh, public transportation, car fare, and mileage reimbursement. Presently, the NAC does not receive funds for transportation at all. Whether it's public transportation funds or reimbursement of gas and mileage, we are using our personal vehicles to get to our destination for foreclosure outreach. Currently, NAC representatives find creative ways to get to and from where they conduct their outreach on their own, from spending their own money on public transportation or asking individuals from the police station to, extort, to escort them around to do their foreclosure outreach. This becomes an inconvenience for individuals. If there was a system in place to ensure that each NAC person had funds to travel to the residents of the community members, it would make a world of difference. Furthermore, more funding can increase the number of NAC staff that can assist with the foreclosure outreach as the number of uh, foreclosure cases increase. I just last week actually received a list of about 30 names for foreclosure, and each month is about 30, 50, 30, 20, things like that. So it's very important. So in closing, I would like to ask again that $500,000 of the fiscal year 2016 budget goes towards funding neighborhood advisory committees. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, With sir. respect to your NAC contract, yes. uh, my assumption is that your budget has been decreasing over the years right. as the federal dollars coming to the city continue right. to, continue to, to uh, diminish. Has your area or your scope of services with respect to your contract also increased at the same time? It has, even the service area, it, it, it increased. Um, so we cover more ground um, than what we initially did. Right, so it, was, it was actually one point that uh, for the foreclosure outreach, I was actually doing foreclosure for not only my NAC, but another NAC that was across Broad Street. So not only did I have my 50 names, I also had another 25 to 30 names. So all together I had about 80. And at that time I had no vehicle, so I was on the bus going three times to that one house and I had to do it within a month before their conciliation conference. Well, 
So that's, that's the type of work we do. It's a challenge. Yeah, it is. But it's worth, it's worth it because if you're able to work with the community members and they find a way, because a lot of times there, there is a way, but community members are not aware of it. But once they find out there is a way, you just, you just open a world of opportunities for them. Right. So that's the satisfaction we receive as NAC, NAC employees. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for your great work. Thank you, thank thank you very thank much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Right. David Ortiz, Guy Larson, and Philip Green. David Ortiz, Guy Larson, and Philip Green. Um, Toy. Good evening. Hey, good evening. My name is David Ortiz, and I am testifying on behalf of the New York Square Community Alliance in support of OHD's Neighborhood Advisory Committee or NAC program. New York Square is a neighborhood nonprofit in eastern North Philadelphia that's been serving the community for over 30 years with childhood education, after school programs, case management services for adults, housing counseling, and a development of affordable housing for rental and homeownership. Our NAC program is usually the first point of contact for neighborhood residents who need our services or similar services are for offered by other community organizations or city agencies. We average about 200 referrals a month. Recent funding cuts to the NAC program may reduce its, its effectiveness at a time when the service area and the population the program serves have grown. In our case, funding has been reduced about 20% and our service area has been expanded to cover a population over 55,000 residents. Previously, we used to serve about 15,000 residents, so it's a threefold increase. Restoring the NAC budget, the previous levels will enhance our capacity to conduct outreach in the expanded area. We made it, make an extra, extra effort to hire bilingual staff in order to reach out to communities where English may not be the predominant language. We translate most of our materials, so we go the extra mile. The North Square neighborhood is now facing gentrification pressure, so it's even more important to connect long-term residents to local sources of employment, assistance in reducing housing costs for individuals, families, and seniors. The assistance includes referrals to programs that reduce property taxes, provide rent rebates, and lower energy costs, such as the city's basic systems repair program. Next, staff also help coordinate residents' reviews of proposed development projects and zoning changes. We see the NAC program as supporting a community that's sustainable for all residents. Currently, staff is assisted by volunteers, and we are researching additional sources of funding to leverage the NAC program. We think these outside funds and adding 500,000 to the NAC budget can increase our capacity to connect residents to programs that are needed to save their homes, alleviate poverty, and improve their quality of lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your testimony. How you doing in there? Thanks. Please proceed. Um, I have a handout as well as a written testimony. Um, good evening, members of City Council. My name is Philip Green, and I am the program director of the North Fifth Street Revitalization Project. We work closely with the merchants and residents of the uh, Almy community um, on the North Fifth Street Commercial Corridor. The bulk of our funding comes from the Commerce Department's Targeted Corridor Management Program and Corridor Cleaning Grants, both of which are funded through CDBG dollars. Our ultimate goal is to establish a business improvement district for uh, self-sustained funding of, uh, of our program. However, the vast majority of our businesses are immigrant-owned mom-and-pop shops with limited resources, so we rely on Commerce Department funds until the district is primed and ready to form a bid. Um, please see the attached uh, flyer right here of uh, our program's accomplishments. Um, a crucial part of our work on North Fifth Street is implementing the Commerce Department Storefront Improvement Program. In the last four years, we have successfully improved 11 storefronts. Uh, these 11 projects use a total of $82,323 in SIP funds, which leveraged $100,114,000 of private investment. Uh, to create a total investment of just shy of $200,000. Uh, 
um, storefront, and storefront facades on a North Fifth Street. Um, these SFP projects range from a simple $2,500 awning to a complete $31,000 facade transformation. Uh, I feel it's also important right now to say that all 11 of the businesses assisted were minority and or female owned and providing goods, goods, goods and services to the low and moderate income neighborhood. Uh, these facade renovations on North Fifth and hundreds more citywide are a major force behind Philadelphia's current resurgence. The SIP program is the broken windows theory at work, literally fixing broken windows. Uh, but last December, HUD imposed strict guidelines on the dollars used to fund the SIP program. Uh, the new rules require projects over $2,000 to comply with David Base, David, Davis Bacon prevailing wage laws. The mountains of paperwork and sky high contractor costs under Davis Bacon uh, have brought all of our current SIP projects to a screeching halt. Without the use of general fund dollars, the SIP program is struggling to repair the city's broken windows. Um, so uh, on behalf of the merchants of North Fifth Street and Olney, I urge City Council and Mayor Nutter to fund the storefront improvement program with general fund dollars in the coming fiscal year. I also urge City Council and Mayor Nutter to continue to allocate CDBG funds toward the targeted corridor management and corridor cleaning programs. With these dollars, we can get back to taking down, shutter, taking down shutters, repairing broken windows, and putting up signs that say open for business again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, uh, my name is Guy Laren. I'm a developer primarily in the west and southwest uh, area of Philadelphia. Uh, I've done approximately 10 uh, storefront improvement grants and brought 10 businesses into uh, various parts of the city. Uh, I'm here, uh, similar to this man on my left, uh, requesting that uh, we, we find a way to f continue to fund this wonderful storefront improvement program. I'm going to give you the example of, of a, a, a neighborhood where I've uh, done most of my work, which is the West Shore area where Councilwoman Blackwell is, uh, has been very helpful with us. Uh, in that area where we started about eight years ago, it, it consists of uh, approximately 400 homes and 400 families who were underserved for uh, uh, basic, uh, basic goods and services. Uh, there were probably five operating stores serving them. Every, everyone, including primarily low-income families, would have to get on a bus or get in a car just for such basic needs as, as milk and, and clothing. Uh, so when we started working there, the community came to us and said, we'd like primarily uh, uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, furniture, really the basics. Uh, and we tried to bring many, many small businesses there, but initially the shuttered storefronts and uh, many of the commercial spaces which have been deconverted to residential uh, were uninviting for, the, uh, for these small shop owners. So uh, we slowly started one building at a time. We brought a bakery, then a daycare, uh, each of them using the storefront improvement grant uh, and really starting to bring life to the community. We later brought a dentist and a pharmacist, uh, and we were able to bring their, uh, the market that had been so, uh, so requested by the neighbors. Uh, each one of these storefront grants involves uh, small uh, contractors, uh, carpenters, painters, uh, primarily uh, neighborhood people doing the work. And then once the work is done, the business generally employs neighborhood people. Our daycare has expanded to a second facility, and now they have a third, and everyone uh, that works there uh, it comes from the direct neighborhood. Uh, I don't believe any of this could have been done without the assistance. These, these uh, small merchants, for, for each of them, uh, even a, a, a few thousand dollars is the difference between doing the rehab or not. And now we're at the point where we have a couple of uh, more tenants coming to the area. We're bringing Philly Homebrew is, is going to open there and employ some people, and uh, as well as a specialty cake uh, 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 baker. And they, they talk about bringing jobs as well as the, uh, the, the, the cost of the renovations. They would, not oper they would not open there if the storefront improvement grants were not available. Uh, so I, I agree with uh, this young man that if the city could find a way to, uh, uh, to continue to fund this program, I think it, it really pays for itself. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much.
Toy Nguyen, Leslie Benoliel, and W. Kaczynski. Toy Nguyen, Leslie Benoliel, and W. Kaczynski. Okay, if I go first, he asked me to. <laughs> I'll let you guys choose. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Councilman President Daryl Clark and, and fellow council members. My name is Leslie Benaliel. I'm the executive director of Entrepreneur Works, which is a Philadelphia based microfinance community development financial institution providing loans and business support services to entrepreneurs and small business owners in Philadelphia. I'm here today as a member of the Mayor's Office of Community and Empowerment's Oversight Board. I'm here to encourage your support for the Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment Opportunities and their request for $1.09 million from the new general fund support for fiscal year 16. As you know, the City of Philadelphia has the highest poverty rate of all the 10 largest cities in the U.S. 26%. 36% of our children live in poverty. These statistics are shocking. They are heartbreaking. It is imperative on each of us to work together to reduce, pov to reduce the poverty rate, and more importantly, to create pathways of opportunity for our most vulnerable residents, especially our children and our young adults. I am very pleased to learn that City Council has made addressing income inequality and poverty one of its priorities in 2015. I see the poster up there. The work of the Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity is an important way to advance that agenda. The new funding requested that will help advance the goals of the Shared Prosperity Philadelphia, our city's comprehensive plan to fight poverty. Launched two years ago by CEO, this bold plan has laid the groundwork that has already successfully propelled direct and collaborative actions of organizations throughout the city to address the multiple and complex challenges faced by those living in poverty. Since Shared, Shared Prosperity Philadelphia's launch, CEO has made good progress, and here are a few examples. We've launched six benefit centers which have helped individuals enroll in public benefits. This has served over 5,000 people. We've doubled the number of financial empowerment centers and helped residents reduce their debt by 5.5 million. And we've increased emergency meals by over 1,000 each week, and there are more. The Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunities Leadership has been critical to coordinating the efforts of hundreds of organizations throughout the city to focus on and fight poverty. We must build on these early successes and be relentless in our efforts to expand impact, reduce poverty, and help the thousands of residents to get on a pathway to a more prosperous for future. They deserve it. We deserve it. I urge you to support the Mayor's Office of Community <laughs> Empowerment and Opportunity to approve their request for $1.09 million in, the new general, in general fund support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Uh, my name is Toy Nguyen. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for CMAC, which stands for Southeast Asian Mutual Assistance Associations uh, Coalition. Tonight I'm here as a, 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 on behalf of uh, the Mayor's com uh, Commission on Community Empowerment and uh, Opportunity, uh, otherwise known as CEO. Um, as a uh, as a member of CEO since its inception, um, I'm here to share my support and encourage your support for, the, for their request of 1.09 million in new general op, uh, uh, fund support. Um, city's, city Council's agenda for 2015 includes as one of its, uh, component, its three components addressing income inequality and poverty. Uh, I feel that this is one of the best way uh, to advance that agenda. This funding will support such items as new benefit centers, the financial empowerment centers, uh, implement, impl implementation of the early learning plan and job training programs. This funding will also enable CEO to serve residents who are struggling to make ends meet 
but whose income is above 125% of poverty, which is $29,813 for a family of four. Um, the, our current funding, a CEO's current funding, uh, the Community Service Block Grant prohibits serving those above that income. Therefore, this, uh, this request is, is crucial. Um, since the launch of a Shared, a shared Prosperity uh, Philadelphia, our plan to fight poverty, um, CEO has launched six Benefili centers which help individuals enroll in public benefits. Um, this has served over 5,000 people and completed over 4,000 applications. Launched a citywide early learning planning process which will be completed shortly and will include a shared agenda around building access, spurring more high quality early, early learning uh, seats compensation, implementation, and financing. Funded two job training programs that connect individuals uh, with barriers to identify job and long-term career opportunities, including expungement services to program participants. CEO's le leadership has been critical to coordinating the efforts of hundreds of organizations through, throughout the city to fight poverty. I hope you will support the efforts, their efforts to expand their impact, reduce poverty, and help thousands of residents to get back on their feet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, good evening. It's good been evening. a long time since I've been here to talk. Um, I'm a member of the Greater Chamber of Commerce here in Philadelphia. And what I would like to talk about is how Philadelphia can actually create millions and millions of dollars. And I'm sorry, state, state I'm, your name for the record. I'm sorry. Oh, my name is Walter Pizinski, P-I-E-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I. -E I. I live at 1927 Deverox Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19149. You want my phone on? You don't want my phone on. Well, You'll probably okay. get it, okay? And I'm a, an economic consultant. I'm a member of the, with the business advisories. And it, it, with the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm not out to criticize City Council, but I would like to put City Council uh, in a position of the City Hall as a corporation, okay? And I have it written here is, when I look inside City Hall, I see the mayor as the president of the corporation and City Council as all the board members that control uh, the city and all its main assets. I mean, we have so many assets, it's unbelievable. And when I talk about them, I talk about all the abandoned buildings that we have in this city right now. And there must be hundreds of them. I got a, a paper right here that I brought that I get and it's got sheriff sales on here that are unbelievable pages of them. And this city can truly, truly, okay, build money. I mean, create money from all these abandoned buildings. And I want to compare this co corporation here of city to a corporation that I have studied over the past two years. It's called Apple Corporation. Over the two years, okay, it was in 2003, it was selling its stock at $700 a share, 700. And I can't imagine how many people were able to blow and buy this stock at $700 a share. But they bought it, them people, in 2013. But what uh, Apple did, and its corporation is just unbelievable. It split the stock. And you understand what split stock is? When you have a, sh a, 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 a um, say you have a, a, a share is worth $100, and they split it, and you will get two shares, but they'll only come down to $50 a piece, so you don't lose no money. It's still, you know, you have the money. What the Apple Compute uh, Corporation did was 
in 2013, it split its stock on a stock market like I've never seen or nobody's ever heard of. It split it seven to one, meaning every person who had only one share now has seven shares of Apple Corporation. And what Apple did that for is it brought the price down to $100 a share. Now, when it did that, the next day, I don't know how many millions and millions of people, investors around the world, went and bought up that stock, okay, and just bought it. Today, okay, over the past two years, the reason they did that was they wanted to create millions and millions and millions of dollars. They didn't want to go to the bank and borrow all this money. They needed investors' money from them. So they lowered the stock down to that price. Now, they, as you know, they got the wristwatch today. They got, you know, all this technical, you know, uh, anything that, you know, that, the pads that we hold and all this. This was all created over the past two years because they lowered that stock and they took in billions and billions of dollars. And what I say here is city council, city as a whole, okay, should lower its taxes. Now listen well, okay, I'm not criticizing anybody. Lower the city taxes. I was wondering how you were going to segue to that. Huh? No, I was wondering how you were. Yeah, I don't know. We're so, I'm here talking about taxes. No, no, I know you for some time. I know. Oh, it's my okay. Too, no, I was just wondering. Too said, much? How's, how's he going to get? No, it's fine. I was just wondering how's he going to get to the tax reduction strategy. Okay, yeah. I'm, all right, I'm sorry about it's, that. No, it's okay. What I'm talking about <laughs> is if the city lowers the property taxes, the uh, What's his name? Taxes. It's the, when you go out and buy something, okay? Sales taxes, the business taxes, okay? What that'll do is, we have the people in Philadelphia today. When they go and buy buy something here, they live in Philadelphia. They'll go over Jersey. They'll go outside city line and buy it, and they'll say, "Well, I'm buying it because the taxes are so high in Philadelphia." They will actually, and city loses millions and millions of dollars for that. If it lowers that tax, all these people who are leaving the city going up in Bucks County on city line, uh, I-95 over uh, up in the Conshohocken, out the uh, Schuylkill Expressway and all city line, they'll stay in the city and begin to invest into this city. Now, we talk about, well, how are we going to make up the difference of these taxes coming down? Well, when you look at here, okay, and you see all these properties that are sitting empty, okay, and they're not, you're not getting no property taxes off of them. These people, when the, pro the taxes come down, these, pre these investors, anybody, uh, I mean, will go, they'll come and buy these, corp these businesses up, uh, these uh, housing and everything throughout the city. It, it, I mean, it'll just go sky high. Okay. I mean, we, we have we, something we, here. We get your point. Yeah. The only right. thing I'm saying is do not raise no more taxes because okay. every time we raise them, we're driving out people. You know, there's people have real estate up on their houses for sale. They've right. had them up for two years. They can't get nobody to come in and buy them okay. because Thanks. the taxes are so high. We Lower them, them and right. that will generate Right. Millions and millions of dollars we get every your point. time. Okay. We have, I'm sorry I'm talking away. I'm no, talking, it's just that we have other people who want to testify. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to, what's his name? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to write this and I'm going to email it in the city council, Thank the whole so bill, uh, uh, this information. Because, uh, like I say, i have talking with so many business people and everyone else, all right. and all they've said is, the city is going wild. They're wanting to raise them and raise them and raise them, and they're pushing out these businesses. Now, we, there's one other sir, thing I sir, have to say. Sir, okay. All right, sir, okay. sir. 
we, we got your point. You can't, okay. you can't all right, have other Mark. people you, you know me. Okay, right. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Thank but you. I just now have to say all that. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Lower the taxes. And I guarantee the city will never forget it. Nicole, we'll gain millions and millions. Nicole, <clears throat> Nicole Allen, Judith Robinson, and Asia Adams. Judith Robinson, Asia Adams. Okay. Council President, there are no more speakers on the list. Well, thank you. I well, would like to thank all of you very much for coming down this evening. Uh, we will be added to the record. Uh, we look forward to a continued dialogue, and thank you again uh, for your participation. We will stand in recess until Tuesday, May 26, 2015, at 10 a.m., which time we will reconvene in room 400 at City Hall. Thank you all very much.